Today, the topic of our discussion is on ascites. So first, in this uh, lecture, we shall be discussing what is ascites, what, is the, what are the causes of ascites, so what is the mechanism of the development uh, of ascites. Then we shall be talking about the clinical features, okay, the effects, and then we shall be talking about the investigations, the treatment. So details shall be discussed in this lecture. So first, let us see what you understand by ascites. So to understand ascites, look at this diagram. This is a diagram of a normal abdomen. This is the peritoneal cavity. You can see the peritoneal cavity. And what has happened here? There has uh, occurred the accumulation of fluid, excess fluid within this peritoneal cavity. So this accumulation of excess fluid in the peritoneal cavity is called as ascites. Now, what can be the, what is the reason of this uh, accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity? So, there can be different reasons of the, uh, you know, for the cystitis. It can be due to any hepatic causes, okay, renal causes, cardiac, right, any infection, gastrointestinal causes, any malignancy. So, let us discuss the causes of this uh, ascites. Okay, see. Look at here, the ones which is written in red. So causes cirrhosis. When we're talking about the liver, the hepatic origin, it can be uh, cirrhosis. Okay, it can be hepatic fibrosis. You have written the most common ones, okay? But apart from this hepatic fibrosis, fulminant hepatic failure, okay? Uh, then uh, lysosomal storage diseases, but carry syndrome. Okay, so these are the different causes which is linked to the hepatic, hepatic causes, okay? Then talking about the cardiac causes. In the cardiac causes, you have got the congestive heart failure. You have got constrictive pericarditis. Okay, then talking about the renal causes. Renal most common is nephrotic syndrome. Apart from this, you have also others are also like if there is any perforation of the urinary tract. Okay, if there is any obstructive uropathy. So this I have discussed, constrictive pericarditis. And amongst the other causes, hypoproteinemia, like if there is less amount of protein, okay, so that will decrease the plasma oncotic pressure and the fluid will exudate in the peritoneal cavity. Or any vein obstruction, like the inferior vena cava obstruction, any infective causes like tuberculosis, Okay, or like any abscess, chlamydia infections. Main is the uh, tuberculous peritonitis. Okay, then malignant causes, malignant neoplasms. Okay, so like, uh, or if you know any malignant deposits from other organs, from malignant uh, cells, okay, so if they get deposited in the peritoneum, or malignancies, neoplasms in other organs, okay, so that can also cause. Next, come to Meigs syndrome. Okay, so what is. Uh, Make syndrome. What is make syndrome? Can you see here? Written here. So actually, make syndrome. It is a combination of if these patients of make syndrome. They usually develop a pelvic tumor. Okay, so this is a non-metastatic pelvic tumor. Commonly, these are uh, this make uh, syndrome. This is uh, occurring. You know, this mainly occurs. This occurs in case of the females. Okay, so this is actually makes syndrome. So syndrome, it's a combination of ascites, non-metastatic pelvic tumor, and pleural effusion. Okay, so usually after removal of this tumor, uh, the both ascites as well as the pleural effusion that results. Okay, so these are the different other causes, causes of ascites. Okay, so let us see how does uh, ascites develop because in these uh, cases, why does ascites develop? See. In any cause of liver, like, you know, cirrhosis or hepatic fibrosis, what happens is that there occurs portal hypertension. You all know about this portal vein, okay, so which is draining the blood okay, so from the different organs into the liver, then from the liver, okay, so that uh, uh, the blood from the portal vein, okay, so it empties, it goes into the liver, from the liver, it passes into hepatic vein, hepatic vein to IVC. So if there is any problem within the liver, okay, so there is a problem in this portal circulation okay so uh, there will be the development of portal hypertension and this portal hypertension when there is development of portal hypertension there is the release of the different vasodilators okay so the vasodilators in the splanchnic circulation and what happens when there's splanchnic circulation okay so when uh, in this uh, splanchnic circulation release of vasodilators in splanchnic circulation that causes dilation of this, uh, you know, blood vessels. And therefore, it reduces the effective circulating blood volume. Okay, so it causes a decrease in the circulatory 
causes a decrease in the circulatory volume so if there is a decrease in the circulatory volume accordingly you know uh, this will also cause a decrease in the renal perfusion decreased renal blood flow okay so whenever the blood flow the blood volume is decreasing which system is going to get activated that is your ras you must be knowing about ras renin angiotensin aldosterone system okay so this ras system gets activated and when this ras system gets activated you can see this angiotensin okay so more amount of angiotensin will be released aldosterone will be released and what is aldosterone going to do it is going to cause salt and water retention okay so this is what is happening when there's portal hypertension these vasodilators are getting released and that is decreasing the circulatory volume ras is activated okay and it is causing increase in the amount of aldosterone which is causing salt and water retention okay so this is one of the mechanism what else now because of this uh, portal hypertension the pressure within the blood vessels okay so the capillary hydrostatic pressure the pressure within the capillaries okay so that is increasing that is causing the exudation of fluid from the capillaries into the peritoneum okay what else again uh, in these cases only when there is cirrhosis or due to any other causes where the protein amount of protein level is decreasing okay so that will cause a decrease in the plasma on cortic pressure again when there is decrease in plasma on cortic pressure there will be exudation of fluid in the peritoneum okay so these are the different causes what else this is mainly linked with the liver what else inflammation of peritoneum now why will there be inflammation of peritoneum there will be inflammation of peritoneum uh, due to any infective causes okay like in case of tuberculous peritonitis right so or in case of bacterial peritonitis in these cases there will be inflammation of the peritoneum so when there will be inflammation of the peritoneum okay so this peritoneum and there will be inflammation of the peritoneum whenever there is inflammation of anything what happens the capillary permeability increases isn't it the capillary permeability increases and there will be exudation of fluid into the peritoneal cavity okay then venous obstruction venous obstruction just like i told you about this ivc obstruction venous obstruction here also this uh, when uh, there will be venous obstruction this will cause the transudation of fluid into the peritoneal cavity okay anything else can occur yes apart from this there can be rupture of any organ okay rupture of a vis uh, organ rupture of a viscous okay so when what will happen if there is rupture of a viscous there will be the blood will pour out from that organ into the peritoneum okay so that will again cause um, you know the accumulation of fluid here okay Mm. and what else okay so and also in case of pancreatitis also okay so there will be uh, ascites or uh, what else is there lymphatic obstruction yes in lymphatic obstruction if there is any reason okay so if this lymph uh, this lymph vessels okay so if they are obstructed okay maybe due to some malignancy some neoplasm okay or due to any other reason if there is lymphatic obstruction then also there will be ascites usually the ascites which follows lymphatic obstruction is chylus ascites okay milky the ascites color you know that is chylus ascites so lymphatic obstruction so these are the different mechanisms for the development of ascites okay these are the different causes for the development of ascites clear okay next let us come to the different clinical features how will the patient present to you with so talking about the different clinical features so how the patient is going to present to you with the patient will uh, present to what the symptoms signs i'll discuss symptoms the patient will complain of abdominal distension and because of this abdominal distension the patient will have difficulty in breathing isn't it because of this increased intra abdominal pressure there will be dyspnea okay there can be orthopnea and because again of this increased uh, intra gastric because of this uh, increased intra abdominal pressure the patient will have grd gastroesophageal reflux uh, dis, uh, gastroesophageal reflux okay so what happens in case of this grd the patient will have uh, uh, the uh, because of this gastroesophageal reflux the patient will have indigestion okay the patient is going to have heart burns okay so this is what the patient uh, is going to like the symptoms the patient is going to present to you with and what are the signs 
in science what are the way are you going to um, uh, like carry out the investigation as you all know first what are we going to do we are going to inspect we are going to palpate we are going to percuss we are going to auscultate okay so let us see one by one yeah so when we are going to inspect the patient okay so when we are going to evaluate the patient okay so first we will start from the history of the patient okay so we will see the age okay so if it's a child then it's more towards tuberculous ascites okay so if it is a middle age then it is more towards cirrhosis of liver okay old age then it is more towards malignancy so first we will take the history of the patient according to the age okay so as i told you the young age middle age okay so accordingly we have to find out na, like what is the cause of ascites okay so just from the history and from the examination later we are going to do the diagnostic paracentesis and all uh, for uh, you know for more confirmatory uh, findings and the old age okay similarly in case of sex what i had told you that in case of females okay so it uh, more in favor of meigs uh, meigs syndrome remember the uh, you know non metastatic pelvic tumor ascites and pleural effusion order of development okay so we have to ask the patient like uh, if it is due to any uh, you know if uh, cirrhosis if it is occurring uh, you know due to any hepatic causes in this mainly ascites is the first feature if it is occurring due to any cardiac causes so here the patient will mainly complain initially that the patient will complain that he uh, you know there is leg edema okay so before after that first initially there is leg edema and then the patient develops ascites so that will go more in favor of cardiac and renal renal causes uh, what uh, you know what will be the what how what will be the history of the patient that initially he had puffiness of face okay uh, periorbital edema and then that was followed by ascites okay so this is order of development okay next you are going to come to the general examination general examination what are you going to do in the general examination uh, we are going to look for the basic things you know anemia jaundice lymph nodes okay edema and all those things so if you find any enlarged lymph nodes okay so again that goes more in favor of any tuberculous causes or malignant causes jaundice again favor of cirrhosis of liver okay if there is breathlessness dyspnea or thopnea okay and uh, uh, right and if there is edema if there is uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea so all these goes more again in favor of cardiac causes congestive cardiac failure okay again if the patient you see that uh, the patient has also developed edema around the eyes you know periorbital edema there is puffiness of face okay that goes again more in favor of the kidney nephrotic causes okay so like this you are going to do a general examination next let us come to the abdominal examination okay so abdominal examination so what are you going to do in the abdominal examination first you are going to inspect okay so in the inspection it is very clear okay so you are going to see that the abdomen is distended right you are going to find that the abdomen this is abdomen it's just written in short okay so abdomen you'll find the abdomen is distended and if the abdomen is too much distended what will happen the umbilicus that is going to become everted isn't it too much distension causes eversion of umbilicus right and uh, if like uh, initially you can if you find if you look at the flanks okay so these flanks you will find these flanks are also full you will find fullness at the flanks and what else uh, see it depends what is the cause of the uh, you know what is the cause of ascites if the cause of ascites is due to cirrhosis or you know if it is due to any cause of portal hypertension remember in portal hypertension when i was talking about when i had taken the lecture on portal hypertension i had told you something about caput medusa what is caput medusa so remember what is caput medusa it is the appearance of the engorged veins radiating from the umbilicus isn't it so you often seen across the uh, abdomen this is the umbilicus so you can see this engorged you know this swollen engorged veins radiating from the umbilicus why does this develop uh, what is the cause of caput medusa this is mainly it is caused uh, due to portal hypertension okay so if the cause is portal hypertension you can also see this caput medusa along with the ascites along with the abdominal distension and fullness at flanks and all so these are the things which you are going to see in inspection okay and uh, 
Okay. Next, what else are you? Uh, then you are going to palpate. Okay. So this is your inspection is done. Next, come to palpation. So in palpation, again, there are many things which you can see in palpation. See when you palpate the abdomen. Okay. So if you find that there is at some at particular at that spot, suppose at this spot there is tenderness. Okay, so you find that the patient is complaining of pain, tenderness, and there is at that particular point. Okay, so there is a local rise in temperature. So this goes more in favor of peritonitis. Peritonitis. Okay, and if there is a presence of caput medusa, and if there is enlargement of spleen. Okay, the splenomegaly. Right. And uh, you know there is ascites, there is splenomegaly, there is caput medusa. Okay, so this goes more in favor of cirrhosis of liver. This is what we are going to find in palpation. Okay, okay. Then you find that in palpation the liver is enlarged. Okay, so there is an enlarged and tender liver. Enlarged, tender liver. Along with that, we already had the previous features of dyspnea, orthopnea, cystitis. Again, this goes more in favor of congestive heart failure. I think you must be knowing in congestive heart failure there is enlarged tender liver. Okay. Yes. Next, you find you know when you palpate the abdomen, you get a doughy feeling. Okay, a doughy feeling, and there is some intra-abdominal masses, presence of intra-abdominal masses, and a doughy feeling. So this again goes more in favor of tuberculosis because in tuberculosis the enlarged lymph nodes are there. Okay, so these this is uh, you know you feel an intra-abdominal mass tuberculosis. Okay, and um, intra-abdominal mass not only tuberculosis it can also go in favor of any malignancy also. Okay, suppose you find enlarged lymph nodes and you know some swollen glands, enlarged glands. Okay, so that also goes in favor of malignancy or leukemia or Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. So these are the different things which you can find when you palpate the abdomen, right? Okay, next come to percussion. See in percussion, I'm going to talk about a few tests which, you, which we commonly do, percussion. All must be knowing how to do percussion. So in percussion, <clears throat> there are three things, uh, you know, two, three things which we can see in percussion. That is one is your shifting dullness. Okay. Another is your fluid thrill. These are the three tests which we do. Another is your puddle sign. What is the difference between these three? Remember, shifting dullness. Okay, so uh, like there has to be a minimum amount of fluid. Okay, so for that for these tests to be demonstrated, like for shifting dullness, at least uh, it requires 500 to 1000 ml of fluid to demonstrate shifting dullness. If the fluid amount is less than this, then this test cannot be demonstrated. Fluid thrill is usually seen in tense ascites. Okay, so in tense ascites, uh, you know, severe ascites, then you can demonstrate this fluid thrill. Now, if the volume of the fluid is less, around 120 ml, then you can elicit this puddle sign. Although this is not, this test is not done much. Okay, so I'll just show you how we demonstrate the shifting dullness. Okay, so, see, so what is done here? So, in this, we start percussing from the midline. Okay, so can you see this? Matlab how uh, you know this percussion is being done? You can see this percussion. All of you must be knowing how to percuss. Okay, so percussion uh, is started from the midline. Okay, and slowly, 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 we start move, moving towards the flanks. Okay, so what note do you get if there is if there is fluid? What what is the note? Matlab, what is the percussion note you get? If there is no fluid, like in the midline, usually there is like uh, as I told you that uh, fluid when it first starts accumulating, you will find the flanks they first become full. When the person lies down in this condition, obviously the fluid will you know accumulate in these areas. Can this area will be free. So you'll get a tympanic note in the midline. Slowly, slowly, slowly from the midline, from the midline, when you start percussing to the sides, when you start coming to the sides, suppose from here, the suppose this much is the fluid level here. Okay. So when you come at this point, okay, so you'll get a dullness, a dullness. Okay. So you have to mark this point and then we'll ask the patient to turn to the other side. Okay. 
I just show you here, you get it. So first, as we see here, that we start percussing from the midline. Okay, slowly, slowly we come towards the side. Okay, so here you can see is written dullness. This is the area of dullness. Then we ask the patient to turn to the other side. Okay, so when the person turns to the other side, this fluid okay, in the flanks. Okay, so this shifts to the side. Can you see the fluid? Okay, so since the patient is turning to this side, the fluid which was here, it has shifted to this side. So now when you percuss this area, you will get a tympanic note instead of a dull note. Okay, this is what is called a shifting dullness. The dullness has shifted. Okay, shifting dullness. Right? So this is how we are going to demonstrate a shifting dullness. Okay, next come to fluid thrill. See, in fluid thrill, what we are going to do is that we are going to ask the healthcare, uh, some other healthcare provider or the patient himself to place his hand in the midline. Okay. And then what the doctor does is that he is going to tap, he is going to tap on one side of this flank. Okay. So he is going to tap here and we are going to feel with our other hand. Okay. So on the other side. So when you tap here, you can feel a fluid thrill or you can feel a thrill Okay, on the other side. So this is what is called as fluid thrill. Clear? Clear? So what are, what are we doing here? We are tapping the abdomen on one side and we are appreciating the thrill on the opposite side. And this fluid thrill, remember, it can be demonstrated only in case of tense ascites, severe tense ascites. Okay? Okay. Next, let us come to the next one. That is your puddle sign. Okay, so in this puddle sign, remember, puddle sign is normally just not done. It is done uh, usually uh, in those cases where you can't demonstrate shifting dullness or this uh, fluid thrill. So what is done in a puddle sign is that. So first we ask the patient to lie prone for five minutes. Okay, and then the patient is told to rise in this position. Can you see this knee elbow position? knee elbow position okay so when the patient rises in this knee elbow position what we do is that we apply the diaphragm of the stetho to the most dependent part of the abdomen okay and then the examiner what he's going to do is that he's going to repeatedly uh, flick near the flank with the fingers okay? he's going to repeatedly flick near the flank with the fingers and then slowly slowly we are going to move the stetho okay across the abdomen it's away from the examiner. We are going to move the stetho away from the examiner. Okay. So we'll find that the loudness, sound loudness, you know, it increases at the farther edge of this puddle. Okay. This test, it cannot demonstrate the sound transmission, which I am telling you, this will not change if the patient is sitting. Okay. So this will change only in this position. Okay. So in this knee elbow position, you start auscultating in the, uh, you know, most dependent part and slowly, slowly you move the stetho away from the examiner. Okay. So this is puddle sign. The importance of this is that this can demonstrate fluid as less as less as 120 ml. For such less amount of fluid, you cannot demonstrate it by shifting dullness or by fluid trim. Clear? So, so this percussion three methods are clear to you. Shifting dullness, what we did, percussion from the midline, then we go laterally towards the flanks. We'll find an area of dullness. We will place our hand there. We'll ask the patient to uh, lie on the other side. Okay, this picture is more better. Okay, we'll ask the patient to lie on the other side and then we will wait for 10 seconds. And again, when we percuss that particular area, we'll find the note has become tympanic. Why? Because this dullness, this fluid has shifted to the other side, shifting dullness. Okay, then I told you about this fluid thrill and I also told you about the puddle sign. So these three things are important. Remember, so these three things are important in case of percussion. Okay, now auscultation doesn't have a very great role in this uh, determining of the evaluation of ascites. Okay, okay. Next is uh, just for your knowledge. Remember one thing that um, what is the minimum amount of fluid required? This I've all told you. Minimum amount of fluid required for shifting dullness is five hundred ml. Okay, fluid thrill, it is around, you know, 1000 to 1500 ml. As I told you, you can demonstrate it only in 10 situs. Puddle sign, it's 120 ml. For diagnostic tap, diagnostic tap means like for the purpose of diagnosis when you're ca uh, carrying out paracentesis, okay, you're tapping the fluid. For diagnostic tap, minimum amount of fluid required is 10 to 20 ml. Okay, 
uh, for ultrasound, if you want to detect uh, this ascites by ultrasound, then the minimum amount of fluid required is 100 ml. Okay, these are some, uh, this thing. Okay, so I told you about the symptoms. I told you about the signs. Okay, and next let us come to the investigation. This is also a very important part. Okay, so let us come to the investigation. So what investigation are you going to do here? So investigation, number one, we are going to do ultrasonography. Then if there is the presence of fluid, we have to diagnose it because remember, we what we do is that we usually tap the fluid, okay, and then we study the nature of the fluid, okay. We see the protein content, we see the, uh, you know, the glucose content, the amylase content, okay. We carry out different tests. We carry out ASB, okay. So we carry out Zeal-Nielsen staining, Gram stain. Why all these things are needed to find out the cause of ascites. We need to find out what is the cause of ascites. So for all these reasons, we need to tap the fluid, which is called as diagnostic parasynthesis. Diagnostic parasynthesis. And last is your peritoneal biopsy. If still the cause is not clear, we can carry out laparoscopy and peritoneal biopsy. Clear? Okay, so what are we going to do is that now we have carried out this diagnostic parasynthesis and we have, uh, you know, tapped the ascitic fluid. Now, how are we going to find out? Okay, so what is the cause? Okay, so this we can find out by doing certain tests. That is, we find, I'll just write down the tests here. Yes, so after we um, tap the cytic fluid, we are going to look at the appearance. Okay, how does it look like? Okay, so if it is a clear or a straw colored cytic fluid, this goes more in favor of any organ involvement, you know, like cirrhosis, okay, so or congestive heart failure or nephrotic syndrome. Although straw colored, you can also find in tubercular, uh, tubercular uh, cases also. Okay, so if, uh, you know, tuberculosis also, you can get a straw-colored ascitic fluid. So clear straw-colored is mainly found in these conditions. What did I say you? Cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, congestive heart failure. If it is having a bloody texture, you know, I mean, appearance, sorry, not texture, bloody appearance, okay, hemorrhagic, um, that is your fluid. So this goes more in favor of any malignancy, okay, peritonitis, clear? So if it is having a cloudy or a, you know, a turbid, a cloudy, uh, 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 you know, appearance, cloudy or a turbid appearance. This again goes more in favor of any infectious like bacterial peritonitis, so bacterial peritonitis. If it is having a green color, deep green color means there is some biliary leak has occurred. Okay, biliary leak. If it is having a milky white color, then it, in this, in, it in, indicates some lymphatic obstruction, obstruction, lymphatic obstruction. Okay, so this is one way just by looking, you know, we can have an idea. So what else things can we see from the psychic fluid? Yes, we can look into the specific gravity. Okay, so when we measure the specific gravity, remember there are two types. Okay, so I'll discuss details the transudate and the exudate. After this, I'll tell you the difference between transudate and exudate. Okay, so if the specific gravity, uh, like two thing, two cases you can have. One is the specific gravity is less than 1.016. Okay, another specific gravity is more than 1.016. So I'll tell you the differences. Okay, usually in transudates, the specific gravity is less. And I'll tell you which all fluid, which all causes, you know, you know which all, in which all cases, the fluid, the cytic fluid is transudate. Okay, then, uh, then next is the protein content. Okay, the protein content again, it can be in usually in transudates because okay, so it is uh, less than 2.5, sorry, it is less than 2.5 uh, grams per dl. Whereas in exudates, okay, so usually it is more than 2.5 grams per dl. The next is SAG. The SAG, I'll tell you details. Okay, so we'll discuss about SAG in details. In this, we mainly measure the difference between the albumin concentration in the acytic fluid and the serum. In the serum, we measure the albumin concentration and in the acytic fluid, we measure the albumin concentration. It can be subtracted, right? So this I'll discuss with you uh, later, just after this. 
then we are going to carry out microscopy in microscopy what are we going to see we are going to see like the uh, you know the lymphocytes okay so we are going to do gram staining why when gram staining what are you going to find in gram staining in gram staining you'll get an idea about the uh, tuberculosis malignancy okay whereas in case of there are more number of lymphocytes okay, so what are what are you going to see if there is more number of uh, lymphocytes what does it indicate more number of lymphocytes it indicates yes they are usually more in case of bacterial peritonitis isn't it so like this is different ways okay so we are going to carry out the microscopy and we are going to get an idea about the cause of ascites clear so these are the different things so i think i i just missed something in microscopy yes microscopy just remember microscopy we just see the number of lymphocytes okay we do gram staining we do zeal nelson staining so i just uh, i think i just uh, said something opposite actually gram staining is mainly done for what gram staining Uh, what does it uh, uh, you know what does it detect it detects bacterial peritonitis zeal nelson staining that is done for tuberculosis right yes zeal nelson staining that is going to detect the acid fast bacilli that is for tuberculosis so anyhow the culture can be done okay so for bacteria bacterial peritonitis or for tuberculosis so these are the different investigations which we are going to do so i hope so it's clear i just write it down again since it is creating some confusion gross appearance we are going to see Okay, we are going to see the specific gravity. Okay, as I told you, specific gravity. If it is more than one point zero one six transudates and less than zero one, uh, sorry, less than zero point, uh, less than less than one point zero one six. This is in transudate. More than one point zero one six is in exudates. Then we see the protein content. Again, the same thing. If it is less than Two point five grams per dl, it is transudate. If it is more than two point five gram per dl, it is exudate in nature. Okay, then we see the SAG, which we will discuss later. Then we see the glucose content. Okay, so this also, then we'll discuss later. Then we look at the amylase. Tell me if the amylase is more. What does it indicate? This is mainly seen in pancreatitis. Yes, if the amylase content is more than thousand units per a liter. Okay, so this indicates pancreatitis, right? What else do we see? I just told you we carry out the microscopy. Okay, so in the microscopy we look for the different cells. Okay, like we look for the lymphocytes. Okay, so we carry out different staining, like we carry out the gram stain. This is done in case of bacterial peritonitis. Then we carry out Zeal Nelson staining. Okay, so this is carried out. For the tuberculous mycobacteria, okay. Then we can carry out culture. This is again done for both the pyogenic bacterial uh, peritonitis as well as for the mycobacteria. That is for the tuberculosis. Okay. So these are the different tests which is done. Okay. Next, how will you differentiate on the basis of this? How will you differentiate between transudate whether it's a what is the nature of the cytic fluid whether it's a transudate or exudate what is an importance why do we need to differentiate because i'll tell you certain conditions where the fluid is of transudative nature and certain conditions where the fluid nature is exudate so we can get an idea to interpret the cause of ascites okay so transudate how does it look like remember the appearance is clear okay it's clear thin colored whereas in exudates it's a turbid appearance Okay, transudate about the specific gravity we just discussed now less than one point zero one six. Here the specific gravity is more than one point zero one six. Again, here the protein content as discussed it is less than two point five gram per dl. Okay, so here it is more than two point five gram per dl. Here total cell count. Okay, total cell count. This is less. Here total cell count is more. Okay, so these are some of the differences between transudate and exudate. Now, why do we need to know, uh, like, what is the nature? Remember, there are certain conditions which leads to a transudate, uh, you know, uh, nature of the ascitic fluid. Like uh, these, uh, you know, mainly the liver involvement that is your cirrhosis, then congestive heart failure. Okay, the nephrotic syndrome, then your uh, uh, your congestive heart failure. Yes, I've already told. Hypoproteinemia. Okay, so these are the causes which mainly causes a transudate 
nature okay, so of the ascitic fluid and there are certain cases where the fluid nature is exudate exudative nature that is mainly in the infective causes malignant causes infective causes like tuberculous peritonitis then coming to the case of malignant peritonitis okay so bacterial peritonitis okay next come to the case of Uh, pancreatic ascites so these are the causes when uh, it is due to the ascites due to these causes the nature of the uh, ascitic fluid is mainly exudative exu exudate nature okay that is why we need to differentiate whether it's a transudate or whether it's a exudate okay next clear this is clear to all of you okay so next let us come to the sag i was talking about the sag so what is sag and what is its importance yes so what is sag sag is serum ascites albumin gradient so what we do is that we subtract the serum albumin concentration minus the albumin concentration in the ascitic fluid okay so if this uh, result you know by subtracting this if it comes to be more than equal to 1.1 g per dl this is indicating a strong likelihood of a, a cause which is in you know any causes which is due to portal hypertension okay so it is uh, indicating a strong likelihood of portal hypertension that the ascites has developed due to portal hypertension and if the value is less than 1.1 g per dl it indicates other causes so i will just show you a chart of this okay yes look at this the sag value if it is sag value okay so if it is less than greater than equal to 1.1 g per dl these are all the causes you can see they all are linked with portal hypertension like liver cirrhosis hepatic failure liver metastasis but carey syndrome portal vein thrombosis veno occlusive disease mixed edema cardiac failure and if it is less than 1.1 g per dl it indicates other causes like malignancy nephropathy malnutrition tuberculosis pancreatic causes secondary peritonitis okay so this is the importance of sag okay so by getting the value of sag it uh, it's a you know a prognostic uh, it's a prognosticator of portal pressure portal hypertension clear so it's clear to all of you uh, about the uh, different parameters okay the sag and uh, you know this transudate exudate the appearance so this is how you are going to examine the ascitic fluid okay next we come to the treatment okay next we come to the treatment okay so what shall be the, what will be the treatment of ascites now what so we have to reduce that fluid isn't it we have to reduce the fluid which has accumulated in the peritoneum so what do you think uh, suppose a huge amount of fluid has accumulated in the peritoneum so what are we going to do are we going to tap all of it out just in one hour will uh, will is that fine or should we uh, you know uh, try for some other measures so that the fluid will get reduced and then we should try for some uh, you know uh, way of tapping it out so obviously we have to first think about some dietary measures or some we'll give some drugs we'll carry out diuresis so that the fluid will be slowly drained out if not we will tap it okay so that is therapeutic way with therapeutic paracentesis okay if still not we will think about some shunts isn't it that is the way you think about the management or the treatment okay that is the way you think about the management or the treatment so what do we uh, do is that if the ascites is very huge you know it's massive so we recommend hospitalization and what we do is that we estimate the patient's daily body weight okay to find if the ascites is again increasing or whether it is decreasing okay we monitor the intake out and uh, you know the output the intake output recording okay so that is done how much fluid the patient is taking and how much urine and output that recording is very important okay the electrolyte determination serum electrolytes okay so all these things okay so these measurements okay so are done in hospital what is the management how we how are we going to treat the patient treat the patient first important is bed rest because bed rest itself induces diuresis okay what else 
should you ask the patient to take more salt or less obviously no we are we are going to avoid because salt will lead to water retention okay so initially there has to be a strict salt free diet okay and this will be followed by slowly if the patient starts improving we can add around 4 to 6 grams of salt but initially it has to be a salt free diet intake of water should be restrict yes we have to restrict it how much we can make it we can make it around 1000 to 1 to 1.5 liter per day okay this much fluid restriction right so these are the dietary measures which we will follow any drugs we will give the patient yes we can give patient diuretics what are diuretics they induce the what are the, what are the diuretics going to do they cause the clearance of salt and water from the body they excrete out excretion excretion of salt and water from the body isn't it so in you know about the different type of diuretics you have an idea about the, what are the different types of diuretics we know about the loop diuretics thiazide diuretics potassium sparing diuretics we must be knowing out of which the potassium sparing diuretics okay the potassium sparing diuretics we have got uh, you know the aldosterone antagonists amongst the potassium sparing diuretics so these are usually the first choice we prefer in uh, these patients why is it so first of all it has got a diuretic potential it is causing excretion of salt and water plus it is antagonizing aldosterone and as we know in these patients of ascites usually there is a secondary hyperaldosteronism the amount of you know the aldosterone is uh, like more in these patients is hyperaldosteronism so by giving this aldosterone antagonist dual purpose is solved first of all diuresis is occurring plus it will also antagonize the excess amount of aldosterone clear so what are the different aldosterone antagonists you know about this is one type of diuretic okay that is your spironolactone this is n spironolactone okay then you have got triamterene Okay, and then you have got others like uh, you know amyloride. So anyhow, aspirinolactone is a drug of choice. Initially, we started at a less dose. Okay, we started at dose of twenty five mg QID. Then we go up to a maximum of four hundred mg per day, per day. Okay, so this is a, a good. If if you know the patient is refractory, it's not responding to this, then we can think of adding. Uh, we can add the potent, which is the most potent diuretic. the loop diuretics okay any examples of loop diuretics you remember it is furosemide torsemide so these are very strong diuretics so if this is refractory patient is refractory to this diuretic we can give this one okay so after giving this diuretics there will be the excretion of salt and water from the body slowly slowly the water will start getting excreted from the body so slowly slowly there will be a loss of weight patient's body okay there will be a weight loss so we have to measure we have to keep a track of this weight loss also it's not that we will you know just we will just do rapid diuresis and you know the patient will lose 5 to 6 kg of body weight per day no there is a goal again for this okay the goal of this therapy when we are giving diuretics or when we are restricting the whatever diet and when we are doing paracentesis there is a goal for this weight loss remember if the patient has got ascites plus peripheral edema both in this case our goal is no more than 1 kg body weight per day okay so maximum up to 1 kg per day uh, you can achieve you should not make it more than that matlab you should not achieve like you should not start so much diuretics that the patient will lose 2 3 kg that will be harmful for the patient and if the patient has got only ascites no peripheral edema then what is the goal that is not more than 0.5 kg per day this is very important this goal is very important this should be kept in mind okay but remember whenever you giving the patient diuretics you should also keep on measuring the sodium levels okay because sodium levels why because these diuretics apart from causing excretion of uh, water it is also causing excretion of sodium so maybe the patient will develop acute hypo hyponatremia that will again cause another problem acute hyponatremia the sodium levels they go very low less than 120 so in that case again you have to stop all the diuretics so whenever you giving diuretics always keep a track of the serum sodium levels 
Okay. And this is the basic treatment which you are going to give. Now the patient is not responding to this treatment. When the patient has failed to respond to this dietary as well as this diuretic regime, we call it as refractory ascites. So in refractory ascites, what are we going to do? We are going to carry out large volume paracentesis. Okay, so how much fluid we can remove? We can remove in this large volume paracentesis around five liters of fluid over one to two hours. So what do you think if we can remove such large volume of fluid? Will it not cause any circulatory dysfunction? Yes, it will cause paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction. So to prevent this uh, circulatory dysfunction, what are we going to do? One side we are tapping this fluid out. Another side we are going to infuse what? we are going to infuse albumin. What type of albumin? Salt-free albumin. Okay, so we are going to infuse salt-free albumin. How much? Eight grams for per liter removed. Suppose you are removing five liter, you have to infuse 40 grams of salt-free albumin. So eight grams per liter of fluid you are removing. This is very important, okay? So large volume paracentesis, but once when you're carrying out paracentesis, along with that, you have to infuse the albumin. Otherwise, it is going to cause circulatory dysfunction, okay? Still, the patient is not responding or, you know, uh, you know, you are removing it again, there is accumulation of ascitic fluid, okay? So in that case, we carry out shunts. We, uh, you know, there's a tips. What is tips? What do you understand by tips? What do you understand by Levine shunt? These are different shunts. I'll just tell you about it. Then Poto Caval shunt. Tips, uh, you must be knowing. What is the full form of tips? It is transjugular intrahepatic potosystemic shunt. Okay, so we are creating a shunt between this portal circulation and this jugular vein. Okay, so trans uh, transjugular intrahepatic photosystemic shunt. Okay. Okay. Then uh, what else are we going to do? What is Levine shunt? Levine shunt is that this peritoneal fluid, again, same way, it is going to directly drain into the internal jugular vein. The peritoneal fluid directly drain into the internal jugular vein. Then you have got photocaval shunt also. There is one more shunt also uh, through which, you know, this peritoneal fluid, this is going to directly drain into the urinary bladder. Okay, so these are the different shunts, uh, but you know, there are some complications, some problems of these shunts also. It can lead to, in this, if you place a shunt and it can lead to infection, it can lead to thrombosis, it can lead to such great amount of fluid coming in the internal jugular vein, it can cause pulmonary edema. Okay, so these are some of the complications of shunts, right? But overall, this is the treatment of your ascites. Okay, so first you start with uh, normal, you know, dietary measures, then you go for a diuretic regime, still not getting control, do large volume paracentesis, and then you can try these, we, we can go for those different shunts, so like tips, Levine shunt, photocaval shunt, uh, you know, and then directly shunting the peritoneal fluid into the urinary bladder. Okay, so this is about the treatment of ascites. So all the aspects of ascites is discussed. What is ascites? Causes. Okay, then we talked about the symptoms, signs, investigations. How are we going to uh, interpret, you know, uh, interpretation of the cause of ascites just from the appearance, specific gravity, protein content, microscopy, transudative, exudative nature of the ascitic fluid, the SAG ratio. Then we discussed about the uh, different, the treatment.